two. Buzz's work in the Ren 1010 serial, The Lone Defender, was popular enough to lead to Buzz getting offered a major role in another serial, 1931's The Mystery Trooper, this time supporting other silent the talkie stars Robert Frazier and Blanche Mahaffey. What's interesting is that on some posters, Buzz is top bill, suggesting that his role here is more starring than his what role was in the Ren 1010 films. Here, Buzz played Billy Holt, younger brother to Helen, Blanche, who both who both of whom are half heirs to a gold mine, the other half being owned by Jack Logan, played by Robert Fraser. Throw in a villain named Jean Gregg, Al Ferguson, and a mysterious uniformed hero named the Mystery Trooper, and you have an exciting Western serial in several episodes. Check out Buzz in this clip. Obviously, this scene is exciting for Buzz's clever escape from the villain's house with the help of White Cloud the Horse, who was nearby. But what I enjoyed about Buzz's performance, really, is the wheels turning as he makes his plan, very evident in his facial expressions of physicality. It was a great bit of realism that made the escape just that much more satisfying when it happened. Later in 1931, Buzz signed with Big Four Film Corporation and had a major role in Flying Lariat, starring as Wally Whale to sidekick Buzz Murphy. The story concerned Wally and his brother, played by Sam Garrett, falling for the same girl and being enlisted to catch a swindling con man named Tex. Drama ensues. Check out Buzz in this scene. Oh. How would you like a good sock on the jaw, Mr. Appleby? I would like it, Mr. Johnson. Then you would set our hand over my share of that money, Mr. Appleby. But I could do that, Mr. Johnson. I'll say not, Mr. Appleby, because I don't know what your share is. Oh, or even that you have any share. Well, how about that gold I gave you for security? <laughs> That's it, Mr. Johnson. How about it? Well, how about it? It might turn out not to be gold at all. Oh, it might, might it? Yes, it might be a gold brick. Wouldn't that idea suggest itself to the simplest kind of an intelligence? Uh, such as yours, for instance, Mr. Appleby. Such as mine, of course. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, that is, yes. Well, what then? Gold. Then, of course, you see. Now, uh, what do I see? That you have no investment at all. Oh, I have no investment at all. No. You have no share of the profit. No, no. I take everything. Oh, you take everything, huh? Of course. All right, then take that. Ah! And that. Oh. And that. Oh. And... Although Buzz was 18 in this film, he still more or less was playing the kid sidekick here, probably due to his short stature and his youthful looks. But, again, the kid sidekick, sit kid sidekick here is there to help the villain and alert, I'm sorry, help the hero and alert the hero to the evils that the villain is doing, which here involves Tex the villain swindling Mr. Appleby out of his money and then beating him up. While Buzz was pretty much just playing a more grown-up version of his previous roles like in Thunderbolt's tracks, he again is still memorable. The calculation and realiz realization present on his face make it all the more interesting when the camera pans to him while he is eavesdropping. Apparently, Buzz made quite the impression in Flying Lariats, and the film was so popular that Big Four Films decided to move Buzz back into his own starring vehicles this time in the talkies. The Cyclone, the Cyclone Kid was the first in 1931, and Human Targets was the second in 1932. Before I explain those films, let me briefly mention that Buzz was so popular with filmgoers, particularly young men, that the Daisy Company introduced the Buzz Barton Special Daisy Air Rifle to capitalize on Buzz's name and continued success in pictures. Googling Buzz Barton's name today brings up tons of results of folks selling antique Daisy rifles of his name, showing just how popular he was at the time. Back to the Cyclone Kid, which saw Buzz top build in his first starring talkie vehicle. Here he played Buddy Comstock, a friend of a ranch foreman, Steve, played by Francis X. Bushman Jr., who both must fight together to save the ranch from an evil posse. While Variety did not give the film a great review, it did mention Buzz positively and said that the film was, perhaps, part of the effort to restore westerns to their one-time popularity niche in the hearts of young America. While I can't find the box office grosses for the film, I can only assume that it did help restore Western popularity due to da the Daisy Company's soon manufacturing of the Buzz Barton guns. In 1932, I'm sorry, 1932, his human target saw Buzz as Buzz Dale, who needs money for his sick mother and must save the day when a family friend is framed for robbing and murdering a man. Adventures ensues. Check out Buzz in this clip.
What struck me most about Buzz's work in Human Targets is that it clearly marks his transition from a child sidekick that warns and aids a full-fledged cowboy hero to being a full-fledged cowboy hero himself that can take care of himself and his family. He is even able to overpower and take out a villain much larger than himself. Variety gave Human Targets a great review. It said, For an up-and-atom western, this is a winner, strong and long enough to stand up alone in the daily change grinds. Although it is full of sh socking, there is realism in the punching not often found in this style of western. Even young Buzz Barton puts over his blows with an adult bad cowpuncher convincingly. Still a lad, he has that certain sincerity and wistfulness of expression which make him 100% likable. You would think that with such a great review and such a successful film, Buzz would be moving on to be a leading man in his own starring vehicles, but it was unfortunately not to be. Big Four films went belly up and Buzz found himself out of work again. From 1932 to 1934, Buzz toured the USA in various circuses, showing off his western riding and roping skills, but in 1934, he returned to Hollywood and signed a four-picture deal with Resolute Productions. All four pictures saw him teamed up with Rex Bell and Ruth Mix. The first of these films was The Tonto Kid, released in 1934. The film followed Rex as, ta as the Tonto Kid, wrongfully framed for murder who fights to clear his name with his friend Wesley, played by Buzz. Along the way, Wesley, also innocent, gets arrested as seen here. And before we get out, well, I'll fetch you to ask you. Where'd you get that watch? No, no, I didn't kill Harry Peck. Honest, I didn't. I swapped the horse for the watch just before he left. Please believe me. Hold yourself together, kid. How are you going to explain why it was buried in your backyard? I tell you, I didn't do it. I hid the watch because I was scared. It's the truth. You're my lawyer. I'll listen to you. You've got to help me. The only thing you can do now is keep your full mouth shut, no matter what happens. All right. I promise. When will you get me out of here? When I decide, it's best. While Buzz wasn't the hero of this film, and was a sidekick again, what I liked about his work here is that the script actually gave him some real dramatic work to do. Buzz gets to plead his case and do more than just be a Western writer. He gets to really act here, and act he did. There was a very quiet, subtle intensity and sadness present in his face and his voice as he is wrongfully accused. In 1936, Buzz supported Ruth Mix again, but this time the hero was played by Hoot Gibson in The Writing Avenger for Diversion Pictures. In a similar type of role to the Tonto Kid, this time Buzz played Tony, a range hand that joins the hunt to round up the villainous Morning Glory Kid played by Hoot, who is actually a martial undercover. Check out Buzz here. Move! You wouldn't shoot a man in the back, would you, Tony? Why not? You did. Did you ever kill a man? No. Well, I have. I didn't want to, but I had to. It ain't a pretty thing to remember. But I never shot a man without giving him a chance. Why, even the morning glory kid wouldn't do that. You're the morning glory kid? I didn't say that. You are. There's a reward out for you. And if you don't head back toward the ranch, I'm going to plug you right now. Go on, move. All right. What I like here is, again, Buzz continues to grow up more and become even more of a hero, this time taking it upon himself to take control of an assumed prisoner. Buzz, who is 23 here, has clearly begun to continue to prove himself as a mature actor, capable of holding his own opposite such experienced Western heroes as Hoot Gibson. Now, stay tuned with me for Buzz Barton, Part 3.